So today we're going to be discussing numerical simulation of critical mineral systems geologic processes. Um, so myself and Thomas are based here in Perth, um, although at the moment we're in different locations. I'm at home uh, and uh, Heather is joining us from Canberra. So today we'll present to you examples of a range of numerical methodologies that we're using and developing within Syro Mineral Resources uh, Discovery Program and how they may be applied to the understanding of the formation of mineral systems and the exploration of mineral deposits. So we'll give examples of models of a range of scales, geometric and geologic complexity. Um, and that complexity is both in shape and, phys and the physics incorporated in, in the simulations and how and why this changes uh, depending on the geological question being addressed. So as an introduction, um, the development of mineral systems involves complex interaction between deformation, fluid flow, heat transport, and chemical reactions. So those four um, broad um, geologic processes. But for an order, in order for geologists to test the influence of these processes and their interactions through what if scenarios and asking questions, we need an efficient simulation uh, tool or tools um, to do that. And hopefully we'll be able to explain to you how we're managing to do that. So why in the first place are we using numerical simulations? From a scientific perspective, it's to improve our understanding of hydrothermal ore deposits forming processes by using observed data and testing conceptual models. And from an industry or exploration perspective, we think that um, this allows us for better targeting decisions based on process understanding. We can test geologic hypotheses before drilling or doing other forms of exploration. And all of that hopefully reduce the risk. Now, of course, this is not to be not meant to be a silver bullet, um, but rather another tool, and we think a powerful tool to be used in conjunction with a, as much geologic information we can obtain as with any other discipline. So it also is a means for highlighting areas that might, re might require more data collection and for developing the next set of questions. So some of the sorts of processes that we simulate um, all focus on deformation fluid flow, and this is applied primarily to structurally controlled hydrothermal ore deposits. Um, we do do heat transport models coupled with deformation fluid flow uh, as well, or just heat plus flow. Um, and in some cases we do simple uh, geochemical reactions. So the coupling of these multiple processes together occurs at various levels. And there's a bit of jargon here, but if you're not familiar with them, those terms and, and you'd like to learn more, by all means, get in touch with us. So there's implicit versus explicit numerical models, there's material dependencies, there's loose coupling, which can be done sequentially. Uh, there's one-way coupling, tight coupling, these are all numeric methods that, um, depending on, again, on the, on the question being addressed and, and the level of computation that we want to expend, then we might employ those different methodologies. This diagram uh, illustrates some of the modeling steps and in individual processes that we simulate and how we often couple them together. Um, and depending on the geologic question that we're addressing, we don't always couple everything together. This saves computation time. So at the top, um, we start. Is my cursor here? Hopefully, um, we start with a with a mesh. So <clears throat> most of the models that we run these days are three dimensions. Although there is still use for for two D models, um, and then that that architecture or that geometry of varying complexity. Uh, can be simulated using either uh, we can apply flow, which of course with hydrothermal ore deposits is 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 critical. Um, we can have heat flow as well, 
looking at things like convection cells, um, as well as deformation, strain and stress, um, fluid pathways can be used to inform simplified geochemical models. Here, this is an example of a, of a 1D model, or it can be used to um, um, inform phase diagrams, which is, of course is also a, a, for, a simplified form of geochemical modeling. And depending on, the, again, the questions being addressed, then we can couple, you know, one or two or, or um, more of these, these processes together. Quite often, where we run these models now is on supercomputers. So we have high performance computing facilities here in Perth um, in, in the form of the POSI Center, and there are other CSIRO um, supercomputers that we may that, that we take advantage of. This diagram is an example of a workflow which combines both the collection and analysis of geologic data at a range of scales. And this is used to modify and test an existing conceptual model. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, the MacArthur River um, base metal system in the Northern Territory. And Heather will talk about that in a bit more detail. So at the center, we have a conceptual model, which is based on the work of Large and, and Garvin. Um, geophysics structure and, and tectonics is used to inform that conceptual model or um, come up with the, with the conceptual model and along with sediment, uh, sedimentology and, and stratigraphy and uh, finer scaled or geochemistry, petrography and mineralization characterization, these are all feed into the conceptual model um, and are used to, to constrain different parts of the geological analysis as well as informing the numerical simulations. And ideally, this is an, an iterative process where you, you define your conceptual base uh, model based on your geologic observations. Um, that feeds into the numerical simulations. You come up with some results that either um, confirm or deny the, the, the hypothesis, and you go back um, to collect more data or use that data to um, to explore or to to better understand your your ore deposit, because our understanding of how all the different geologic processes interact is incomplete, and also because we don't have the computing power to simulate everything together, we have to break things down into a, into manageable programs. This diagram illustrates one way to do this and forms a basis for the remainder of the presentations today. So here at the bottom axis, we have increasing geometric complexity. And by that, I mean um, the number of geologic units that might be uh, incorporated into the model, the number of faults, uh, the degree of non-planarity, or in other words, more, list, more realistic shape. So I'll be talking about some models that are reasonably geometrically um, complex, but have only a few different processes incorporated in them. So I'm primarily a structural geologist, so I'm in, in interested in structurally controlled ore deposits. Um, and I'll show three examples uh, after this. Later on, after I finish speaking, Heather Sheldon will um, present to you some moderately geometrically um, complex models, but have more geologic processes in them. So she'll add in, on top of deformation and heat, uh, uh, sorry, deformation and fluid flow, she'll have heat transport as well. Um, at the other end scale, closer to, um, you know, where we have increasing physics complexity, then Thomas is going to present models which quite often are very simple. Um, it might be a cube of just one material, but the physics in there is much more detailed. Um, ah, of course, and ideally, we'd like to be up, up here where we have both, um, inc you know, high degree of um, geometric complexity, 
all the bumps and wiggles uh, in our in our geologic models, as well as as much physics uh, and coupling of different geologic processes in there. But um, at the moment, we're breaking things down, um, but obviously striving for those more more complex models. So the first example that I'll show is from some work carried out with uh, Bardock Gold uh, at the time of the, the project um, took place as um, Excelsior Gold. Uh, and this was in an area surrounding their Zoroastrian deposit north of Kalgoorlie here in Western Australia. The models are aimed at determining ro the role that different deformation events have on localizing strain and potential gold bearing fluid pathways along lithic logic boundaries of varying rheologic contrast. And also how subsequent deformation events interact with pre existing structures and those same lithologic contrasts. Now, the models have been used to prioritize um, many prospects and to determine, to, to determine what areas may be underexplored. So, in the top left, we have our geologic model, um, quite complex in a 2D sense, although what has been done here is the, all the contacts have just been extrapolated down dip, uh, downwards. So unfortunately, there's no change in dip of, of units. Um, so that's the whole model. On the top right, we've got two different sets of faults uh, in two different orientations, which depending on uh, the timing of deformation, we can basically turn those off or um, incorporate those where those faults would be at a later stage into the, the pre-existing geology. And then on the bottom, we've got some, some results. So on the bottom left, we've got dilation. So the, the degree to which um, the rocks are expanding or contracting and thereby, thereby um, subsequent um, pore pressure conditions might change and allow for either fluid to flow in or out at higher rates. And although it's probably a bit hard to see uh, at this resolution, uh, on the bottom right, we've got our fluid flow vectors at one particular point in time during the, the, um, the run of the model. And running a whole series of models um, has been used to define some potentially prospective areas. Um, or highlight areas where there's uh, current current prospects that could use some more work um, or some more uh, some more attention. So on the left, what we've done is we've run a series of models where the deformation direction uh, is changed. So we've run seven different models, and then these dots here indicate areas where we've got significant failure in the rocks in all of those models. So if something's purple, purple, that means that in all seven, mo seven models, that area has failed. Whereas um, the yellow areas indicate that uh, only four of the models um, are likely to have uh, failed in that area. So this is just, I guess, um, pinpointing areas where lightning might strike uh, more than once. So uh, having uh, showing uh, areas that are conducive for um, failure or dilation under a range of different deformation scenarios. And then on the right hand side, we've done the same thing where we've applied a later deformation event um, and added in the, the second set of faults and done, done the same thing. So those are just some ways that we can use to perhaps prioritize areas um, within a, an exploration tenement. Second example, going down a scale. So this is on the deposit scale. Uh, and again, is a combination of moderately complex geometry and deformation fluid flow only. These models represent unconformity related uranium deposits, such as those in the Athabasca Basin of Saskatchewan, Canada, and Alligator River's uranium field in, in the Northern Territory. And in these deposits, mineralization may occur at or 
at, below, or above the unconformity between deformed Archean basement gneisses. Um, so in this example here, the blue and the, and the greens, we've got our unconformity here, and then we've got undeformed Proterozoic sandstone sitting on top. And uh, in this example, which is meant to represent the MacArthur uh, deposit in Saskatchewan, the mineralization is commonly below the unconformity in the basement rocks. Over here in another scenario, um, in a different uh, deposit, this is meant to represent Cigar Lake deposit, mineralization occurs generally at or above the unconformity. So running these two um, reasonably complex geometric models um, has been used to formulate and, and uh, allowed us to look at which parameters are a bit more, um, need more uh, sensitivity analysis. So we've then made that taken those more complex models and created a very simple model where we've just got sandstone in yellow, basement in, in, in blue, and, a, and one fault, a planar fault. And we change um, just the basement uh, rock um, rheology, the fault dip, and the far field stress direction or the direction that deformation is, uh, is directed. And just one example of, of how we've done that. This uh, is a series or a suite of models where just the fault dip has been, um, has been changed. And it's a cross section through four different models. So top left, um, we've got fault dip of 30 and then bottom right, we've got fault dip of 60. And as we change the fault dip, then the direction of fluid flow changes, as does the degree of dilation, which is the what the colors are. And although it might be a bit hard to see, these are these, these black fuzzy areas are are meant to be um, fluid flow vectors. So with low fault dip, that promotes downflow, and any fluid fluid or fluid rock interaction causing mineralization is more likely to occur at or um, below the unconformity, so down here. When we have a steep fault, then that promotes upflow and any fluid or, or fluid rock reactions are more, more likely to occur here. Um, this is the unconformity here, so it's more likely to occur here or up in the sandstone. The final example is from a project which has been recent, recently completed uh, this past June with Navarre Minerals in Western Victoria. Now, they've identified a number of basalt domes with mineralization similar to the Magdala deposit in Stahl to the north. So there's Stahl and, and Navarre are currently exploring here. This is the Irvine basalt, of which this is a geometrical representation. Um, and they're also exploring down here uh, a place called Langy Logan. Now, the aim here was to determine how the shape of basalt domes controls hydrothermal fluid flow during deformation. Are there different orientations and variable, um, are, sorry, are different orientations and variable dip and plunge of the domes more conducive to localized fluid flow during different interpreted deformations in gold events? And so based on existing drilling and geophysics and together with uh, some further geophysics uh, constraints supplied by my colleagues over in Sydney, Andreas Bjork and, and Clive Foss. Um, a number of simulations uh, were constructed of varying shape where um, and, an, and had a number of different deformation directions of, uh, applied to them. And those are those match um, previously interpreted um, deformation events associated with gold hosting events. So the variety of the shapes show that shallow dome dips and plunges are preferentially dilated under specific deformation directions. And models, the models highlighted areas that may be more prospective and have uh, and have little deep drilling, thereby opening up some, some potential targets. 
So up here, as I mentioned, we've got our geometric representation of the basalt dome. Um, there's a thin permeable unit mantling the dome under uh, which sits underneath and the surrounding rock mass, which here is made transparent is, is uh, sedimentary. So turbidites. And these are some results showing um, where there's moderate or shallow dip uh, on the flanks of the of the dome. There's significant dilation and these fluid flow vectors are flowing towards that area of dilation. So this is a, an area of, of low pore pressure um, to which the, the flow is, is, is moving towards. In an area to the south where they've got less drilling, um, the diagram in the middle here shows where their assays um, are anything above uh, 0.1 ppm or gram per ton. Um, these are these are planned views on either side of that diagram. We've got um, two different scenarios. So there's a gold event at um, which has in, been interpreted to be occurring during east-west shortening, and the model results here. The, this time dilation is represented as, as dots, so warmer color is more dilation. And in both scenarios, so on the, on the, on the other side here, we've got, there's a gold event which occurred under north, northwest to south, southeast, directed shortening. And <clears throat> both these, these moderately plunging areas under both those different deformation uh, events suggest that those are, are perspective. So that opens up some areas worth, um, worthy of further drilling. So those are my three examples. Um, first one at the camp scale in the Yilgarn um, with Excelsior Gold now Bardock. We were looking at how different def deformation events affect strain localization and the, and the potential gold bearing fluid pathways along pre existing structures and with logic boundaries of varying rheologic contrast. And that showed in some cases that thin dolerites, where they are cross cut by or in close proximity to northeast striking faults or, um, or bounded by sedimentary units are, are more conducive for hydrothermal fluid flow and potential mineralization. At the deposit scale, we are looking at variable fault orientation and host rheology and, and deformation direction in unconformity related uranium deposits, looking at how um, fault dip deformation direction and, uh, and very variation in basement rock may control both the magnitude and the direction of fluid flow within faults. And asking the question, does this control the vertical location of deposits with respect to the unconformity? And the model suggests that Shallow dipping faults with dip slip motion promotes flow down, where deposits are more likely to be in the basement. And that with steep faults with deformation closer to strike slip, that promotes upward flow. The mineralization is more likely to, to occur in the sandstone. And finally, the project uh, which dealt with basalt domes in Western Victoria, looking at how the shape of basalt um, the basalt can control hydrothermal fluid, fluid flow during deformation. Are different orientations and variable dip and plunge of the domes more conducive to localize fluid flow during interpreted deformation control events? And it was found that shallow dipping portions of domes where deformation is at a high angle to their strike promotes increased dilation. And that's it for me. And uh, we'll now hand over to um, Heather, but just some acknowledgements. Um, projects were carried out with Northern Territory Geological Survey, Bardock Gold, um, Navarre Minerals, and we made extensive use of the pausing supercomputing center. So thank you. I will stop sharing. Okay. I'll share my screen now. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, clear. Good. 
Um, yeah, so I'm just going to carry on from, from what Peter was talking about, moving to some models that are geometrically a bit simpler, but looking at in more detail at some of the processes, in particular focusing on heat transport um, as an extra process um, in this example. So the example that I'm going to um, focus on is the MacArthur River um, zinc lead silver mineral system in the uh, MacArthur Basin in the Northern Territory. Uh, so that's located in the in the Batten zone um, uh, adjacent to the Emu Fault. And there's a number of deposits. Um, the, the MacArthur River one is the, the largest with about 20 megatons of zinc. Uh, Tina is a more recent discovery it's, um, that's, that's quite close by. Now, the MacArthur River deposit has long been interpreted as a SEDEX style deposit, meaning that it's interpreted as uh, a deposit that formed on the sea floor by um, uh, metalliferous brine coming up from depth and depositing the minerals on the sea floor to a change in redox state. Um, but some recent work that was done by Sam Spinks and some others in, in did with the NTGS. Um, found that there was strong evidence for a diagenetic or epigenetic origin of this uh, particular mineral system. So that the, the, the mineralization formed within the sediments rather than on the seafloor. And that's really interesting because that means that the fluid coming up the emu fault or the related faults somehow had to deviate into the shallow sediments rather than getting to the seafloor. And that's something we explored with the numerical models. So this is a conceptual model the river mineral system. This is quite old now, 20 years old, coming from Large and Garvin's work. Um, we've got here um, a cross section through the Batten Fault Zone. This is the Barney Creek formation at the top, uh, mainly dolomitic siltstones with some black shales. And that's that's what hosts the mineralization. We've got the Emu Fault Zone here. Um, and the idea is that we have um, an oxidized uh, based on brine coming down through the system. Uh, it's probably sourced from some evaporitic deposits. Um, it's picking up metals from um, volcanics and, uh, and other sedimentary products of, of volcanic and other igneous rocks. Passing through this red layer that's an aquifer unit, coming back up the emu fault, and then metals either on the seafloor or, as I said, possibly within the sediments of the Barney Creek formation. Um, and Garvin um, did some work with, with 2D numerical models to show that that, that that whole flow regime could in fact occur and it could be driven purely by thermal convection. So this is a density driven flow just due to temperature variations and there might be a role of salinity in there as well. So that works in 2D. This is Garvin's um, 2D model. It looks rather like this, this drawing and um, we see that we have fluid coming down through the system and back up the emu fault and creating a syngenetic deposit on the seafloor. But those models did not address the possibility of the diagenetic mineralization. So some further questions that we wanted to answer in this project is what happens in 3D? What happens when you consider the extension of that 2D model along strike? Um, can we explain both those syngenetic and diagenetic mineralization styles? And how does deformation affect that, that thermal convection fluid flow? So um, in some of our models, we apply deformation to it to look at that effect. We know that this was a tectonically active setting, so it was predominantly extensional. There is evidence of an inversion event that may have corresponded with the timing of mineralization. So we can investigate the effect of those things. So this is our 3D model, which is a simplified, very much simplified version of the geometry. Obviously, there, there's great complexity in the faults and the stratigraphy and so on uh, in the Batten Fault Zone. But this is showing the main elements that are relevant to this mineral system, we think. So uh, the key elements here are this, this aquifer unit um, that you might remember seeing in the cross section, and it comes down to meet the emu fault down here. And here we have the Barney Creek formation in the light blue colour, which is hosting the mineralization. And the aquifer and the emu fault seem to have relatively high permeability, so they're going to focus the fluid flow. 
So we model fluid flow driven by heat and we model the heat transport with the moving fluid and by conduction. So we've done a few things in these models. We've varied the heat flux into the bottom of the model uh, in a, a reasonable range for this tectonic setting. Um, we varied the fault permeability because that's one of the big unknowns um, is how permeable were the faults in these systems. And we looked at um, imposing some deformation on the system at varying strain rates, both extension and shortening in a north-south direction, which, which fits with the tectonic setting. So, um, as I said, fault permeability is a really key control in this system. And we need to be able to explain both that syngenetic mineralization on the seafloor and diagenetic or epigenetic mineralization within the cells. So these are the two fault permeability scenarios that we considered. We had what we call an open fault, where the fault is permeable all the way to the seafloor. And so the hot fluid can come up, exit onto the seafloor and drop the minerals there due to the change in redox state, often associated with a black shale. In the what we call the closed fault case, which corresponds to diagenetic mineralization, the top part of the fault is assumed to act as a barrier to fluid flow. And this is consistent with what we know about faults in um, high porosity rocks or unconsolidated sediments. When you shear um, a high porosity rock or sediment, the porosity has to collapse and you create a barrier to fluid flow. Whereas in lower porosity rocks, the faulting creates a pathway. So we assume that at some depth, the fault changed from being a fluid pathway to being a barrier, and that caused the fluid to deviate out of the fault into the Barney Creek formation and um, deposit the minerals there. So we investigate both of those scenarios in the model. So this is an example of some of the results from the model in the open fault scenario, so where it's permeable all the way to the sea floor. On the left here is the fault and the aquifer, and I've stripped the rest of the model away. You can see here the temperature contours are showing you that thermal convection is happening along the fault. Uh, so there's fluid circulating like this in the fault, and it's also circulating within the aquifer. And that's really important because in this system, the metals must be coming from that aquifer and the underlying rocks into the fault. It's no good just having fluid circulating within the fault. Um, you'll notice that these, these arrows are showing the flow. Uh, the longer the arrow, the faster the flow. Um, we've got upward flow being concentrated um, in these relatively narrow upwelling zones, and then you've got broader zones of downflow of cold fluid in between. You can't actually see the arrow pointing down because they're smaller. Um, so this is a really important aspect of the 3D nature of the system. In a 2D model, you wouldn't see that. This diagram here is showing you the pathways of fluid particles that started out in the aquifer. So this white line, an arbitrary line through the aquifer. I've got a cross section here just so you can see where it's coming through the aquifer, that red unit. And the particles would flow down the aquifer into the fault, back down and up again to the sea floor. Strongly three-dimensional. And that convection is really focusing that flow. Um, what we found when we analysed the volumes of fluid that were coming up through these convective upwellings is that you could make a 20 megaton zinc deposit in, an, in less than a million years by this process. Um, then if we move on to a closed fault example where the fault has a low permeability just in the top 300 metres. Um, the arrows are a little big in this one because I'm showing you a higher heat flux scenario, but you can see that the arrows in this case curl around and the fluid's going to go back down the fault because it can't actually get out onto the seafloor. Those arrows appear to go out onto the seafloor just because of the way they're scaled. So in this case, most of the fluid, um, if we look at those particle paths, most of them go up the fault and then back down the fault, but some of them deep out into the Barney Creek formation, which is up here. It's a little hard to see, but you can see some of those lines coming back into the Barney Creek formation. And that's going to create diagenetic deposits. And we found there that to make your 20, 20 megaton deposit would take on the order of one to two million years. It's a bit longer than the syngenetic deposit because it's the, the flow is a bit slower. Then if we impose some deformation on those models, so we, we start, we establish a convection without deformation, then have a look at the effect of deforming 
Um, this is a plot of the maximum vertical fluid flux in the fault and against the strain um, at varying strain rates. So the blue ones are shortening, the red ones are extension. As you might expect, if you shorten the model, you squeeze the fluid out and up. So um, we actually increase the upward flow in the fault, that's the blue lines. If you extend it, you tend to pull fluids back down, and so we tend to override that upward convective flow. But the interesting thing is, at typical geological strain rates uh, in the green box there, really not very much is happening. So what we're seeing is that extending or shortening this system at a, a, a moderate geological strain rate is not going to have much effect on that convective flow. But of course, deformation was still important because that's what made the fluid flow pathways in the first place. So just to summarize, um, we were able to use some simulations to test aspects of the conceptual model. And in particular, we were able to look at um, how we could diagenetic mineralization, given that we had this strong new evidence for it. And we found that we were able to explain both styles of mineralization in a geologically reasonable time frame just through thermal convection alone. And the 3D aspects are really important. You can't model the system in 2D because it isn't 2D. Um, even without having any complexity along strike in the model, we find that the system, that just the physics of the processes make some complexity along strike in the fluid flow field. We get that focusing of the upwellings. In reality, of course, there would be geological heterogeneities along strike like bends in the fault or offsets or um, stratigraphic units with different properties, and they would probably focus the, the convective upwellings. Um, we know that deformation must have created the fluid pathway, so the faults, but probably did not influence the convective flow very much according to, to our model. Then we, can t we could go further with this. We could look at more complex or specific geometries like Peter was showing relating to particular locations or we could look at things like uh, additional physics. So the effect of salinity, for example, is known to be important in these sorts of systems. OK, so that, that's all from me. I will hand over to Thomas now, who is going to take us to a different level of complexity where the geometry is, is very much simpler, but the, um, the physics is more complex. I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So coming back, let me start the presentation properly. Coming back to this uh, conceptual map of the presentation, I will indeed look at the very last component on the far left top corner, which is um, those very small cubes, as Peter said, with a single homogeneous material, and yet encompassing a quite a bit of physical uh, complexity. So here, looking at such system, is to look at what we call material instabilities. So these are instabilities that are not due to the geometry, but purely to the response of the material. So I've been looking at such problems for the last few years in collaborations with quite a few people. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge the collaboration of Klaus Wegener Lieb and um, Mandelis Peveakis. So those material instabilities are actually playing quite an important role, especially if looking at things like localization phenomena. And really, in geology, this is some of the most interesting uh, things we're looking at, including uh, faults or folds, fractures, boudinage, landslides, and of course, mineralization. Because the center of attention for us is indeed uh, exploration of mineral deposits. Now, just because we're looking at material instabilities does not mean that we completely deny or neglect the importance of geometry. But it's important to note that before we understand the geometry, we need to understand the material behavior itself. So it is just a question of getting to the biggest problem first. Now, I just have a bit of time to show you a couple of examples today. And uh, they are actually not on these slides. The first one is the problem of episodicity. And by that, I mean the intermittent fault reactivation of a shear zone. So we've all seen you know, shear zones moving in this uh, stereotypical Thick slip motion uh, as displayed in this cartoon. And as we all know, there are many ways to obtain such a behavior, including from a purely mechanical perspective. So the particular aspects that we are interested in is the one that have effect on the flow because mineralizing fluids are uh, primordial. 
And in this instance, uh, one of the best examples we've got is this picture of the Glarus thrust in Switzerland, uh, where you can see um, horizontal thrust uh, basically slicing very thinly, very neatly the mountain in half, uh, accommodating more than 40 kilometers displacement. Now, beyond this uh, spatial information, we can also infer some temporal evolution, looking at thin sections that show the overprinting of multiple shear zones, one on top of the other. And in the bottom insert, we can see some evidence of uh, really high uh, porphyry pressure uh, cracking the rock. Now, it's nice to know that we have a model that can capture these behaviors, this special resolution, uh, and also capture the temporal evolution at the same time. So thanks to this model, we can actually relate uh, the evidence that we can see from exhumed thrusts like this one, to some other phenomena like episodic tremor and sleep events happening in subduction zones all around the world today, and that can be monitored through GPS stations. So we have those subducting plates moving in the same staggered manner. Um, in, the, in the example of Cascadia, uh, like this plate here, we have a movement of about five millimeters in, occurring in about two weeks and repeating itself every 14 months. So, what is happening behind this and the whole model is actually quite complex. And for this, I would refer you to this great paper by Viso, explaining it in, in details for those who are more mathematically inclined. But basically, the ingredients are just displayed in front of you. So it's all about considering the thermal, hydraulic, mechanical, and chemical processes. And when you put all of these together uh, inside the shear band under constant stress, and we consider the shear heating, which is the increase of temperature due to mechanical deformation, the fact that the uh, rock uh, is pretty saturated and that some chemical reactions can occur, like in the case of carbonites, uh, there will be some fluid release reactions that produce superparticles too. And we just know that we need some simplified chemical reactions, but accounting for the fact that the forward reaction is endothermic and that it's mostly considered to be reversible. Now, that would produce uh, some fluid in excess pore pressure that can be accounted for by the evolution of porosity linked itself to the permeability. Now you put all of this into a nice set of equations, and this is where you call a mathematician to solve all of this. And the interesting part is that there exists a little part of the um, parameter space. It's a tiny window for which some quite interesting behaviors occur. And this is what we call the oscillator. So you've all seen oscillators uh, probably, you know, in a garden uh, nearby where you know this uh, constant influx of water is feeding it a, a bamboo stick and every now and again just emptying it. Now this is exactly the same thing that occurs in our system and we have this limit cycle in the temperature for pressure uh, phase diagram where we have this very slow motion equivalently to feeding in the bamboo where basically the influx of energy is allowing you know, the system default to creep very very slowly and the, the shear heating increases the temperature only just slightly. However, uh, this is enough to activate a little bit more the chemistry, which is temperature dependent, uh, producing a little bit more fluid, which in the conditions of low permeability lubricates the fault, makes it move a tiny bit faster, producing a bit more heat, producing a bit more fluid and so on. And before you know it, you have this chain reaction leading to this very fast event, which is the emptying of the bamboo stick analogy, um, and whereby the temperature rapidly shoots up, the chemistry is now going full speed, producing a lot of pore fluid pressure, pore pressure goes up, the temperature goes down because of the endothermic nature of the chemical reactions until the system stops and diffuses back to its original uh, um, um, point. And that means that it can then continue and again and again and oscillate. So we developed a finite element code called Redback to model such processes. And you can see on the right hand side, the evolution of temperature, extra uh, sharp peaks of temperature using very, very fast. And on the second row, you can see the corresponding evolution of the pore pressure with the simultaneous peaks in pore pressure, just slightly after, uh, and diffusing at a different time scale. And finally, the fault displacement with this uh, staircase behavior of stick slip motion. Now, what I should have shown as well is the evolution of permeability, because at every one of those peaks, when the system reactivates basically the fault opens up and becomes extremely permeable with jumps of orders of magnitude in permeability. And this is the relevant part of our exploration. So that's, I don't have much time, so I'm not going into much details, but please feel free to contact me if you are interested in these models. Uh, all I want to show you is uh, one particular example uh, of episodicity. And because episodicity is about 
staggering of different events in time, you will not be surprised if I tell you that my second example is looking at periodicity, which is um, you know the occurring of different events uh, collocated in space. So for the periodicity, I'm basically looking at compaction bands. And uh, you've all seen you know, some compaction bands. Here's an example on the left-hand side uh, from the US, where you've got these sub-parallel features that are orthogonal to the main direction of compression. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, some nice results from uh, Mustafa Sari, one of our mineral resources, uh, collaborating with CSRO Energy in the geomechanics lab in the building in Perth and producing those nice compaction bands. So all those features here are basically the illustration of some four collapse mechanisms leading to much lower porosity, which of course has a dramatic effect and a negative effect on the flow. But uh, as is usual in nature, there are many ways to uh, observe features that look the same and that could be very different. And in this particular instance, what I'm interested in is into a new theory that was published by uh, Mandelis and Klaus in 2015 uh, about conoidal waves in solids. So without going too much into details, basically what this is, that this is a material instability, uh, which is important because it means that we can expect the features not to be too much driven by heterogeneities, but by the physics itself. It has a more of a predicting power. And of particular importance is the fact that it leads to some regular spacing between those compaction bands, as well as the fact that those compaction features are actually of higher mobility. So it makes them completely radically different from the compaction I showed in the previous slides, which were of lower mobility, uh, as those ones are basically open flow channels. And you can see in this figure uh, some jumps of orders of magnitude of the fluid flow inside those periodic features, which of course has strong implications in terms of uh, mineralization, which is where interest comes from. Now, this problem is a particularly challenging one. And when Peter was saying that you know, in the top diagram, I was looking at the uh, 3D blocks, actually, it was being very nice to me because for this particular instance, we're looking at 1D blocks. That's how hard this problem physically is. But yet we're following the traditional scientific method, just with a slight twist. So usually people start the scientific method with the observations. You have nice special observations from which you get some measurements, infer some processes, formulate a conceptual model that you will validate either in the lab or numerically. Uh, before you can modify the hypothesis and iterate. So this is a traditional process, but there's nothing that says that we should start with the observations. And in this particular instance, indeed, the process started with the formulation. So it started as a theoretical model. And the, important, the importance of noting that fact is because then numerical simulations become pretty much the only way of taking this forward, not just to calibrate a model that has been already observed, but really to validate the whole theory and understand how things work in order to infer how to proceed with the laboratory experiments. So we are uh, lucky to be able to have Mustafa on board, and that's a picture of him yesterday in the lab, working on those compaction band features, and collaborating as well with uh, Victor Callow and his group in, uh, at Curtin University on the numerical side. And I um, just have time to show you basically one little result of this 1D models uh, that Roberto Sear, um, one of his PhD students, has been developing, uh, adding some robustness to the numerical method, allowing us to capture those peaks in one dimension, the stress peaks, and allowing us to then run some continuation methods uh, to understand the steady state of the problem and understand how many peaks could be observed. So understanding the number of peaks and the location as a function of all the material parameters and boundary conditions. So I know I went extremely fast on that slide, so you got, but it's still very much work in progress. If you've got any questions, please feel free to contact me. So really, I just wanted to say uh, what material instabilities actually look like and why we are studying them uh, using numerical components. So if you didn't know about it, hopefully you will be convinced that even just looking at a single cube of a homogeneous material does present an interest. Uh, we often we think that this is all understood, but this is far from the case. Um, that includes important aspects like episodicity or periodicity, uh, which could be critical for mineral systems. Now, the conclusion of the whole presentation is basically that numerical modeling can serve extremely purposes. So Peter showed us that we can use it to quantify some pretty much understood processes on quite realistic settings. And Heather took us you know, down the, the line of looking at more conceptual studies to investigate the effects, the geometrical effects, the effect of the material properties. 
And finally, I just showed you uh, about how we can use numerical modeling to investigate some fundamental material behaviors. So really, as Peter said in the introduction, it really is about uh, which tool to choose or which approach, and that really depends on the nature of the, of the question at hand. So we need to pick, to handpick the processes we want to consider with their respective time length, um, time scales and length scale, and this dictates the best tool for the job. So, of course, as Peter showed this beautiful picture of the grail, uh, this is what everybody is working towards or simply waiting for that tomorrow we will have a nice simulator to be able to capture all the complexity that we need in the, in the harshest uh, uh, 3D geometrical complexity of the geometry. Uh, yet, at the same time, it's important to note that the real value is into the path towards this ultimate goal, um, because numerical modeling is above all about asking the pertinent questions behind all the observations, and that becomes so important in our era where we are being flooded sometimes with observations. Because as Robertson Davies eloquently puts it, the eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and give back the microphone to Ryan.